When we moved here to Castle Rock, there were just under 49,000 people. At the end of 2020, there were over 73,000 people. That's an increase of 49%. In fact, the latest U.S. Census tells us that Castle Rock's not only the fastest growing city in Colorado, it is the 14th fastest growing city in America. That's incredible. Now with growth comes opportunity. Opportunities to serve more people. Opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with more people, expanding God's kingdom. Opportunities to meet the needs of people in our town. Now I know there's a lot of challenges with growth, but there's a lot of opportunities. And at the top of that list, is the opportunity to be a shining light of hope and of life to the people in our community and those moving into our community. This is why we need a permanent home. And although God has used our portability to reach thousands of people, think about the tens of thousands of people in our community and those who are moving here. And portable communicates temporary. And we want our community to know that Front Range is gonna be here for good. And we're gonna to continue to be a church that's gonna reach those who are spiritually disconnected. We're gonna to continue to meet the needs in our community and we're gonna impact this community the best that we can. You see, having a permanent home is gonna let our community know that we're here. We're here for them. And we're here for them for good. So here's the fun part. What are we doing? As many of you already know, we've purchased 8.5 acres in North Castle Rock. And this land may be bare right now, but it's the perfect canvas to not only dream about, but to construct our future home. A future home that will have a 500 to 600 seat auditorium. This auditorium will be a place where we're gonna see our friends, our neighbors come for the very first time and be introduced to Jesus. God's gonna do miracles here, restore relationships here, and deepen faith here. We'll also have a dedicated, secured kid space for every age group. Each space will be a place where these kids can come, have fun, build relationships, and grow in their faith in Jesus. In addition, we're gonna have a, a special spot just for kids with special needs. If you know my story or the story of our family, uh, then you know this really excites me, and it excites many others. Where we can have a place where these kids can come and know that they are loved by God and loved by our church. I believe we're gonna see thousands of people come to know Jesus in this place. People with their own background, their own faith journey, their own purpose given to them by God. You and I are gonna see our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors be invited to this place, receive Christ. We're gonna see this church be used by God to impact this community and beyond. Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you are here. Uh, whether you're joining us in person or you're, you've stayed in your pajamas at home or maybe you're dealing with some sickness or maybe you're on fall break, I uh, mean, we're grateful to have you. Uh, our hope and prayer is that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, man, we have a lot going on in this series called For the Church, For the City, where we're talking about, man, what's our next step as a church, and uh, we're gonna give you some stuff toward the end of service as well that will give you more information. You just saw uh, this video as well. And I've just been, uh, man, just so blessed and humbled by the participation of so many of you engaging in the devotionals and in community group discussions and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm just so proud to be your pastor and thankful that you're taking uh, this journey with us. The goal that we have is huge. We mentioned it last week, our goal is to raise $4 million over the next two years, and that's a massive amount, but uh, the only way that we get this future home is to be able to raise the funds, and we have some great plans uh, for this home and for how we're going to bless our community, how we're going to grow as a church, how we're going to reach more people and care for our community in even greater ways, but uh, the only way we get there is by you and I having a plan, by you and I uh, kind of achieving the same stuff. So here's, here's kind of our goal. We have two goals of, of this series and of this, this campaign. Number one is 100% participation. We want everybody to be engaged. Man, if this is your first time here, thanks for coming. We're not talking about you right now. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through a, a message here in a minute, and I believe that God's going to speak to each one of us. Uh, but if you call Front Range home, then we want there to be 100% participation. What does that mean? It means attending every week, uh, being in a community group, and then praying. 
Hey, God, what do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me? How do you want to use my generosity uh, to make a difference? I believe that we're going to look back on this moment and say that was the moment that God took our church from where we were to where we're going to go and, and, and the opportunities that we're going to have. And we're going to be like, man, that was our moment. And we stepped in as a church and God used it in such a powerful way. So two goals, 100% participation and two, $4 million. We've got to be able to raise these funds. Uh, there's no way we can step into this home without doing that. Uh, it's a lot of money. I mean, $4 million is a lot. It's over the next two years is what we're asking people for commitments. And uh, we've created this gift chart uh, where it kind of shows you, like, here's the different levels of giving that we need. Now, you may be looking at that going, man, those are big numbers. And some of you may be going, well, why isn't a million dollars on there? And if that's you, come talk to me. We can have that conversation. <laughs> I can easily edit this and put it on there. Uh, but they, we, just this, this is just kind of a plan to help us know, okay, here's how we can track uh, where we're at. Uh, there's a commitment card on, on all the seats, and we gave them out last week. We're going to give them out every week. You, here's what we're asking you to do with that. You don't need to fill that out today. We're not asking you to do that. We're asking you to take that home and just pray. Hey, God, how do you want to use me in this moment of the life of our church? Uh, and then on Commitment Sunday, which is November 13th, we would love to have everybody back. And that's going to be where we go, hey, let's step in as a church and let's see what God is going to do. <clears throat> Lastly, this Tuesday at 8 o'clock, we're going to do a Q&A. So if you're like, man, I've got some questions about this thing or I'd like to know a little bit more or whatever, uh, we're going to do a Facebook Q&A. Uh, you can get more information at frontrange.info. Uh, and uh, it'll be, Mike and I will be on there and we'll answer any questions that uh, you guys have about where we're heading as a church, about this uh, building as a, 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 in general, or any questions that you have about where we're heading. I'm excited because this is going to get us into a home. We've been borrowing somebody else's home for the last eight and a half years. And I don't know, I, I don't know, like in your normal day in life, you would never borrow somebody's home. And we have to borrow somebody's home every Sunday. Uh, I can't wait to finally have our own home. And you guys will help us step into that. So let's pray. Father, we just come before you. And God, I just thank you. Father, you know where I'm at with this. You know that I'm excited. And yet there's so, so much anxiety around it as well. And just, man, wondering, God, if we're going to get there. But at the end of the day, Father, we trust in you. God, move in our hearts, move in our lives. God, do what you want to do in us and through us. God, give us opportunities. God, go ahead and start increasing things in our lives so that we can be more generous. Father, we just thank you, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we talked about a little bit of the how of the project. Now we're going to talk about how we move forward into what we talked about last week. If you weren't here, here's what we discussed. We talked about the challenges that we see in our society right now and the challenges that the global church is dealing with. And that we respond in one of three ways to the challenges. One, uh, we can integrate. Integrate means you become just like the rest of society. You become like everybody else. You blend in. You look like everybody else. You can isolate. Isolate means you look at everything. You're like pretty much everything is bad. Everything is evil. And so you kind of retreat from everybody or everything. You stay away from people or society or whatever. And lastly is impact. Impact means that we choose to step forward into the darkness because light, the light of Christ, always repels darkness. So we step boldly into the darkness knowing that God is going to use us to repel that darkness. I would say that most of us, if not all of us, would say we desire to impact. We desire to have a purpose and to do something with our lives, to transform a community, to transform lives. All of us would say that, but the question is, how do we get there? I mean, how do we actually make a, a difference in the lives of those around us? How do we actually make a difference in our community? Well, what we're doing is we're studying this time period of, uh, of God's people. It's around uh, 600 B.C. Uh, let me recap a little bit of what we talked about last week. God's people, they're surrounded by King Nebuchadnezzar. He's besieged the city at this point. And there's been times where this has happened to the Jewish people, and God has shown up. And God has just done miraculous things and set them free, but he's not going to do that this time. In fact, this time, it's more like, hey, your sin got you here. Now you're going to suffer the consequences. Well, Babylon defeats Judah, and they begin to carry the people into exile. And I wonder at that point, like, what are the people thinking? Like, what's going through their mind? Like, are they thinking, like, hey, this won't be that long. 
Like, we'll learn our lesson, and then, you know, God will relent, and, and we'll go back to Jerusalem. We'll go back to our, the town that God, the place that God promised us. I mean, it can't be. Let's just tell God we know we did wrong, our bad. Let's ask for forgiveness, and God will kind of wipe it all clean, and we won't have to suffer the consequences too long. It makes me think of my kids. Uh, my kids, anytime they get in trouble, they always try to get out of trouble as fast as possible. Any other parents experience that? I like the other day they were fighting and, um, and it was like, you know, just they're, it's a boy and a girl and they fight all the time. Uh, and we were done. We we're done. We we're fed up. We're like, that's it. You guys are getting serious consequences. You're not going to be able to use technology for a month. And they were like, what? <laughs> like, like the end of the world as they knew it had just been like, just, it's gone. Like, like that, that's it. Like we had just thrown them back into the dark ages, like the 80s. You know, like we just throw them way back into the 80s, like no technology. And they did great for like three hours. <laughs> and they were awesome for the, that time period. But they were like, what do you expect us to do? You like want us to read or like maybe go outside and play? Like, what do you want from us? I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've created monsters in my house, you know. And they're like, okay, dad, this is like three days in. Dad, can, can, can we get off punishment? No. Okay, what if we clean the house? No. Okay, what if we were nice to each other? I'm like, wow, that's a, a great thought. Thank you. No. Now, I knew in the process that I was punishing myself more than punishing them. Can I get an amen from the parents? <laughs> right? But, but you have to stick to your guns. And, and the people, I, I think the Jewish people at this point are like, surely God's not going to stick to his guns. Well, God speaks to them in the midst of this. And he speaks to this guy named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was... A bullfrog, yes. Last week, somebody in this service came up to me afterwards like, he was a bullfrog too. I'm like, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, he was a prophet of God. Uh, and a prophet meant that he heard a message from God and he spoke that to a person or to a group of people. Uh, and so we're going to hear the words spoken of God through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 1, it says, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So everyone who survived, everyone who's in exile, he's saying this letter is for you. Verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All right, here it comes. God's going to say, I got your back. Don't worry about this. It won't be that long. I'm going to deliver you. I'm, I'm going to destroy the nation of Babylon. Like, what is it, God? What are you going to say? Verse 5, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Wait, what? Like, build houses, plant gardens? God, are you saying we're going to be here for like a year? That sounds crazy. Verse 6, Mary. And have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Hold on. Not only plant gardens and build houses, but now you're talking about marrying and having kids and then marrying them off and then them having kids. We're talking three generations here. God, what do we do to deserve this pain? And what we're going to see is we're going to see God saying, hey, I got you. I know you don't want to be in this. I know you don't want to be experiencing this. But I'm with you. You're my people. And I've got you. Verse 7. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, this is kind of the, the, the leading passage for this whole series and talking about this idea of settling in a place and, and loving that place and praying for that place and seeing it prosper. You can imagine the people here are going, hold on, this is getting a little ridiculous, God. I mean, you're telling us to seek the prosperity of the city of Babylon? I mean, these monsters were the ones that came in and destroyed our homeland and took us into exile. And, and now you're telling us that this is what we have to deal with? I mean, we thought you would say that you would show up after a few days or maybe a few months, maybe even a year. But now you're saying we're going to be there for a long period of time. And not only that, but now we have to, like, seek the blessing of these people and of this place. You can imagine the disappointment. I mean, they thought maybe God would relent after a short time period. Maybe God would deliver them. But God's saying, not only am I not going to relent, I'm, 
asking you to settle down. I'm asking you to invest in this place. I'm asking you to do what you can to love and to bless and to pray for and to care for this place. Imagine the disappointment. I mean, this isn't like wanting Chick-fil-A on a Sunday and realizing that it's Sunday. Like, not that type of disappointment. This is cuts to the depth of the soul. Like, this is not good. And I think God's trying to teach them a couple principles in the midst of this. One, that you can thrive anywhere God places you. That you can thrive anywhere God chooses to place you. Now, sure, we all want to be in, like, the best place. Right? Partly that's why we live in Colorado, because this place is amazing. We want to be in a place that has sunshine most of the, most of the year. We want to be in a place that has four seasons. Or, or maybe you want to be in a place that like, is in the right political spectrum or no political spectrum or, or whatever. Like, you want to live in the perfect place. And yet God's saying, wherever I place you, that's where you can thrive. You thrive where I choose to put you. If you focus on me, I think another principle that he's trying to teach them is that if I've called you to a place, it's for a bigger purpose. You're not just there to, the, to just go through the motions. Like these people, they saw their situation as a punishment, but God saw it as purpose. And God's looking at us and he's going, if I place you somewhere, it's for a greater purpose. You weren't just brought here for your kids or your grandkids or for your job or whatever. Whatever the reason is that you were brought here or your parents were brought here or whatever, you weren't just brought here for those things. God's like, if I plant you here, it's for something so much bigger. God doesn't call them or us to integrate or to isolate, but rather to purpose, to impact and so if God's saying to me that, hey, Ernest, you can thrive anywhere I place you, and I've called you to a place for a bigger purpose, then what do I do? Like, how do I live out that purpose? How do I live out this impact in the world around me? How do we impact the city? Let me give you three ways to impact the city. Number one, choose to love unconditionally. Choose to love unconditionally. When he says to pray for the city and to seek the blessing and the welfare of the city, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. He's saying you got to love well. you got to love unconditionally. This is the difference between settling in a place and occupying a place. Remember the Occupy movement? Remember it was this movement where people were trying to create change. And how were they doing that? They were doing that by saying, hey, hey look at us. Hey, you're, you're going to pay attention to us, and we're going to try to get our change across. They were trying to change systems. But here's what I know. You can't change a system without changing people. And you don't change people through a system. You change people through love. I think back to the first time that I went into a church, and it wasn't the message that got me, which is kind of disappointing now that I'm a pastor and, I'm a, and I preach all the time. The message didn't change my life. The worship didn't change my life. It was this older lady at the front door that said, I'm so glad that you're here. And I remember thinking, like, you probably shouldn't be glad that I'm here. Like, I abuse alcohol. I do drugs. I don't have the same beliefs as you. I don't even believe that God exists. And yet you're saying that you're glad that I'm here. That stuck with me. That made a massive difference. That was almost 30 years ago. It wasn't the, the, the system of the church. It wasn't what the church did that Sunday. It was that a person chose to love me. This is what God has called us to do, to settle down, to grow roots in a place, to love that place, to love the people unconditionally. But love doesn't always equal acceptance of beliefs. That's where we get rubbed wrong sometimes. We think, well, if we love somebody, we've got to accept what they believe. And I don't accept what they believe, so then I don't know if I can love them unconditionally, Ernest. But if you have kids, take your kids as an example, right? If you have kids, you love your kids, hopefully most days, but you don't accept what they believe all the time. I mean, I think back to the, the crazy things that my kids have said or whatever. Like, I've got one kid that, like, loves aliens and cannot wait for aliens to come back and, like, take his dad. I just gave him away. <laughs> I have one kid that, like, she grew up, so I'm giving her away now. She grew up, like, believing that fairies existed. She had this, like, little fairy door in her room. And I'm like, that is creepy and weird, and she loved it. But because she believed it and I didn't, I wasn't like, oh, I can't love you. Like the other day, my son said something. He said, hey, Dad, 
you're the strongest man that I know. And I was like, now I can love you. (laughs) I accept that belief, Wyatt. No, like when you're kids, like you love them even if you don't accept what they believe. And my prayer is that we as a church, that we would love people despite their beliefs. That we as a church, that we would be a church that you don't have to believe to belong, but you belong first. And then hopefully we help you with your beliefs. Hopefully we help people by the way that we love them to come to know Christ. If I walked into that church the first time and they said, sorry, sir, uh, do you believe that God exists? Do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? I would have walked right out. They weren't expecting me to believe anything at that point. They just wanted me to know that I belonged. We want to be a church that you know that you can belong. But the only way that we do that is to love unconditionally. That's the only way. So if you want to impact the city, you got to choose to love unconditionally. Number two, you got to choose to invest sacrificially. Choose to invest sacrificially. When you choose to raise a family someplace and you choose to do what that scripture says, to build houses, to plant gardens, to like invest in a place, you have to invest sacrificially. Like when we moved here as a family, we knew that and our kids would go to school here, and so we wanted to, to get involved there. Our kids would get involved in sports or music or dance, and we would get involved there. We would go to high school football games and eat at different restaurants and all of that, and, and we felt like we were investing, but there was also a benefit give, being given back to us. That's just a normal citizen. That's just being a normal human choosing to be a part of a community. But if you want to make a difference, you have to invest sacrificially. You have to say, I'm willing to go above and beyond what other people do. I'm willing to go, what is mine and what can I contribute to this place? Even if everybody else is not contributing it, even if it doesn't make sense in certain time periods, if I can choose to do something to invest in some way, I'll do it sacrificially. This is what we're asking people to do with for the church, for the city. And with this whole campaign, we're saying, hey, we've, we've got to invest sacrificially. And of course, there'll be a benefit to us. I mean, we'll have a church, we'll have a, a home, we'll, we'll have a place that you don't have to go outside in the freezing cold to go use the bathroom, you know? Like, there'll be a benefit to us, but it's also a benefit to our community, a place where we can better serve those around us, that we can love our community in even greater ways, that we can impact our community in even greater ways. But the only way we get there is by choosing to invest sacrificially, saying that I'll go above and beyond what's normal or what's typical to invest in a society, to invest in a city, I'll go above and beyond that, and I'll invest sacrificially. So you've got to choose to love unconditionally, invest sacrificially, and lastly, you have to choose to live by faith. You have to choose to live by faith. I love that God doesn't say, hey, you're going to be here for a while, and have fun. And he follows it up with these verses, and you probably heard some of them before. They're some of the most famous passages in scripture. It says this in verse 10, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banish you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. After 70 years, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to bring you back. Then he says one of the most famous passages in, 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 in all of Scripture. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for a future and a hope. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you call out to me, I will hear from you. What's God saying? He's saying, I'm, I'm with you. He's kind of pointing back to the whole reason for this is, you know, hey, if I've placed you there, you can thrive there because I'll be with you. If I place you there, it's for a bigger purpose because I'll be with you. He's just trying to remind them. And I wonder how many times they needed this reminder. I wonder how many times they needed to go, hey, remember what God said to us? Like they hear this word and then they go there and they start planting gardens and building houses and all of that and then the culture's rubbing against their values and there's just issues going on and they're having issues with their neighbors because they believe very differently than than, than one another and they're going, man, we're, we're just having a hard time. Hey, remember what God said. Remember that God's gonna be with us. 
Remember that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Remember that he says, if you cry out to me, I'm going to hear you. Remember, he says that if you seek me, you will find me. He says, I have plans for you. Remember, Ernest, I have plans for you. Remember, Ernest, I have plans for you. I wonder how many times they had to be reminded of these truths. Then I think about my own story. And when we moved here nine years ago to start Front Range, and we were so excited, and I, I didn't know what challenges we would go through. And a couple years in, our son got diagnosed with some of his special needs, and, and it would have been a lot easier, a lot easier to just move back, to go back to where family was, to have the, the support system that we had back there. And it would have been a lot easier to do that. We actually had people from back there like, just move back. It would be easier and all that. And then you hit COVID, and, man, churches were... Woo, it was tough. And so many friends of mine moved away. So many pastor friends of mine quit the ministry. It would have been easier to do that. It would have been way easier to just quit, go back. We just had to keep reminding ourselves of what God said. Reminding ourselves of the promises. Reminding ourselves that you can thrive anywhere God places you. And wherever God places you is for a bigger purpose. We need to be reminded but that takes faith. You know, it's easy to change things. It's easy to move. It's easy to get away from what you feel like is darkness. But I'm going to say something that I've said many times from this stage. Never change in the dark what God told you in the light. Meaning never change when things are hard and challenging and the darkness is surrounding you. Never change anything there. What God told you when everything was good. When everything was easy. When everything you felt like, man, I could hear God's voice. Never change in the dark what God told you in the light. The only way you do that is by faith. It's by saying, okay, God, I'm going to step forward in faith here. So what darkness are you going through right now? What are you being presented with in your own life? What are you walking through that, man, it would be a lot easier just to change? It would be a lot easier to walk out on your marriage. It would be a lot easier to just give up on life. I was talking to a guy the other day that he said, Ernest, it would be a lot easier if life was just over. Man, just fight. The darkness is hard. The challenges can be tough. But your God is with you. He'll never leave you. And he'll walk with you in the midst of whatever challenges you're going through right now. Just cling to him. Cling to him. Sometimes it's simply walking by faith. Like, I don't know how, I don't know why. I can't see the destination, but I'm going to continue to take a step forward. And then for this whole conversation about for the church, for the city, it's going to take a major leap of faith for all of us. Here's what we've done. We've created a brochure that we're going to pass out uh, right now. And here's what I know. It's like, we pass these out. You're going to want to listen to or read that and look at that and not listen to me. Just stay with me for like two more minutes. Two more minutes. You can take a look at this brochure. It's pretty awesome. One of my favorite parts in it, there's a, a section about stories of people here in our church that their lives were impacted here. And I love seeing that. I love reading that. Again, don't open it yet. Don't open it yet. I see you guys. <laughs> Just wait. Just wait. And whatever you choose to do with, for the church, for the city, it's going to take faith. And here's what I've said. I've said this to, to multiple groups of people, and I've had to say it to myself many times. As you pray through this, there's going to be two numbers that come into your head. One, I would say, is a, 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 like a fear number, like I, I, an easy number, like a, a soft number. Like, I could, do, I could probably do this. I could probably give that, and it won't, like, take a whole lot. And there's another one that's like a, a faith number. It's like the only way we get there is if God shows up. And we're going to have to sacrifice some things. We're going to do some stuff that we're going to have to change some things. 
to be able to get there. There's going to be two numbers, and we're all tempted to go the easier, softer, more comfortable number than to go the, the faith number. But what will we do? If we want to make an impact in this place, we have to love unconditionally. We have to choose to invest sacrificially, and then we have to live and walk by faith. And God, we need you to show up. And so that's my prayer. As we think about investing in this place, as we think about God brought me here, God brought me here for a greater purpose. You didn't come here because your parents wanted to move here or because your job brought you here or because this is an incredible place to live. You were brought here on purpose. And this is an opportunity we get to step forward. And as you pray about that, just say, God, help me to love unconditionally. Help me to invest sacrificially. And then help me to step, help me to walk by, help me to step into this by faith. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you that, man, these people... Your people were dealing with similar things that we're dealing with today. And God, yet, even in their situation, it was so much worse. God, there were time periods that they couldn't even worship you or they would be killed. And yet they chose to love unconditionally, to invest sacrificially, and to live every day by faith. Father, I want to do that in my life. I pray that that would be true for our church. That as individuals, Father, that we would go, okay, how can I better love people? Especially with those I don't agree with or I don't accept their beliefs or we're not on the same page. How do I better love them? God, search our hearts, Father. Give us direction with that. Father, how do we invest sacrificially into this place? How do we love and serve this place in a way that it will be sacrificial? That's not normal, that is not like the rest of society or the rest of the citizens here, but God is done with a sacrifice. And Father, how do we step forward in faith? Father, for those who right now, God, are wrestling with change and wrestling with stepping out of or running from darkness, God, I pray that you would Give them the courage and the boldness to stay planted where you have placed them in their marriage, in their mental health, maybe in their job, maybe it's in this community. And that, Father, you would help us to boldly step forward in faith. And as we do, God, may you use us transform the people around us. May you use us, God, to invite our neighbors, to invite our co-workers, to bring them here, and may they hear about your good news. May they know that they belong here first. And then eventually, through the love that people show them, may they choose to believe in you and what you've done on the cross. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name.